Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler, and my guest today is Joe Lombardo. Joe is an act, a peace activist, and he's been a peace activist more or less his whole adult life. And since um, this situation with Ukraine and Russia is on the news 24-7, I saw a, uh, a presentation he did last week which really knocked my socks off. It was great. So I invited Joe on the show to talk about how he feels about what's going on and to talk a little bit about his panel. And hopefully I could get some of his panelists on the show at some point also. So Joe, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Cynthia. I'm glad you're interested in hearing an alternative opinion because um, we really only hear one side of the issue on um, uh, the US media. And I really think that the propaganda in the United States today is the thickest I've ever heard. I mean, it's more than we um, heard during the Vietnam War or during the Iraq War. It's very, very one-sided. And you don't hear the whole context of the war that is going on. And so it's important for people to understand that and for people to analyze that. And to do that, you need all the facts, which you really can't get in the United States. I mean, we hear, for instance, that Russia is um, censoring or banning um, uh, uh, outside media. Um, and But we don't hear that the United States is also doing that. So um, a lot of the media outlets that come from Russia or come from countries that are sympathetic to Russia, um, uh, uh, Iran, uh, China, and others um, have been censored. And not only that, there's been a lot of um, uh, internal censorship, censorship of, of um, uh, Americans that are, are giving voice to some of these things. We see it a lot on social media, but there's been two great uh, documentaries um, done by Oliver Stone on Ukraine. I encourage people to look them up and uh, see them. Um, the problem is, of course, they've been banned from YouTube. So there are some uh, other sources that um, have been putting them out there. If you do a search, you might be able to uh, find um, some of those. Do you um, know the name of them? Uh, one, I think, is just called Ukraine. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I will look those up and I will send them to you and maybe you can tell listeners on your program what they are. I'm, I'm not remembering. Um, okay. There's another good documentary, which is called Donbass. Uh, Donbass is the region in, in the um, eastern part of uh, Ukraine that's closest to Russia, where there's a lot of uh, Russian-speaking people and Russian ethnic people um, that have a very, very different uh, position than you, we see in Kiev or we see in Washington and New York. Um, in fact, they see the uh, Russian troops as liberators because there's been a war going on there for eight years. Um, they've been bombed because they have not wanted to be part of the Kiev government after the coup in 2014. I'll explain the coup in 2014 in a minute if you'd like. Yeah. But um, uh, basically, they uh, uh, um, <clears throat> formed their own independent areas. One's called the Donetsk People's Republic. The other is called the Luhansk People's Republic in Donbass. Um, and basically have uh, decided they didn't want to follow uh, Kiev, the, the um, capital of, of Ukraine anymore. And uh, they've been bombed ever since. They've been shelled and bombed, and um, uh, thousands have died. About 14,000 people, is the estimate, have died out of this. So this war has been going on for eight years. It's just recently that um, it got to such a fever pitch, and uh, Russia decided they needed to go in. So anyway, uh, it does start back in 2014 when there was a coup. Um, the uh, president uh, of the country at, at the time was someone who was for making better relations with Russia. Uh, he was the head of the largest party 
in Ukraine, which is called the Party of Regions. The second largest party in Ukraine was the Communist Party. And there was an uprising um, in Maidan Square in Kiev um, against the government because there was a lot of corruption in the government and there were reasons to be against the government. The economy was in a free fall. The economy was in terrible shape. Um, and uh, so they were looking for loans to um, make their economy better. And uh, they looked to the EU, the European Union, and they looked to Russia. And Russia was going to give them much better terms on their loan. So he was leaning towards going with Russia. And um, uh, the people that did not want to see that um, uh, took over the square in, um, in Kiev. Um, and then from all over the country, extreme right-wing elements, and they have a very strong right-wing neo-Nazi movement in Ukraine came there and turned the whole thing violent. And um, basically with support from the United States, John McCain went there and um, said, you're doing a great job, but go all the way and overthrow the government. You might remember Victoria Nuland, who was the um, Under Secretary of State. Uh, she went to uh, Madan Square and handed out treats, and um, uh, you know encouraged them in what they were doing. Um, and later on, she was heard on the phone, overheard on the phone. Someone hacked her phone, and this came out, and it's all over, it was all over the internet. And she had had to admit that it happened, uh, speaking to the ambassador. U.S. ambassador to Ukraine, and basically deciding who was going to be the next government in Ukraine after it was overthrown. She, she wanted some guy uh, named um, uh, Yatsenuk, Arseny Yatsenuk. He was an extreme right winger, ringer from the Slavoda Party, which is a neo-Nazi party. That's who the U.S. wanted in there. Uh, the Europeans didn't want him. They wanted a, another guy. Um, uh, and there's a thing named, I think his name was Klechnik. He was a boxer turned politician. And uh, people might remember Victoria Nuland saying F the EU because they wanted someone different than the United States person. But the US person did get in there. And one of the first things they did was ban the Russian language, which was spoken by one third of the people in the country. And they put extreme right wing um, neo-Nazis into positions in the government. Uh, nobody voted for them, of course. It was just a coup government. They took over the government and, uh, and they put these right-wingers also in, in the military. There's a very famous battalion called the Azov Battalion, which is staffed by real Nazis. I mean, people that wear swastikas on their sleeves and carry swastika banners and um, so forth. And it's called the Azov Battalion. Um, and so uh, a lot of people who, especially of Russian ethnicity, uh, didn't like this at all. And um, in Crimea, they decided to leave um, Ukraine and go with Russia. Um, you, Crimea is a little peninsula uh, kind of between Russia and Ukraine. And it had been part of Russia until 1956 when both countries were part of the Soviet Union. And Khrushchev, who happened to be Ukrainian, who was the prime minister at the time, uh, gave it to Ukraine. It didn't really matter because they were all the same country. So when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, Crimea was part of Ukraine, but now they wanted to go back to Russia. And they had a vote, and they overwhelmingly voted to go back to Russia. In the Donbass area, which was also Russian-speaking and Russian ethnicity, they broke away, as I said before, and have continually been bombed for the last eight years. So that's some of the background. The other piece of the background is when the Soviet Union collapsed in 1990, Secretary of State James Baker had a meeting with the leaders of the Soviet Union and promised them that if they did not oppose Germany coming together, it used to be East Germany and West Germany, that um, NATO would not move one inch further to the east of Germany. It wouldn't go into um, Poland and Romania and those other countries. Um, however, uh, they went back on their word and it's now in 14 of those countries. 
and that now they started talking about Ukraine becoming part of NATO. And, you know, in these NATO countries, we hold war games right on the border with Russia. We have nuclear capable missiles in these countries. And Russia was not going to allow that to happen in Ukraine, which is the lar largest border with, you, with Russia. In fact, they felt that this was a red line and um, they couldn't uh, allow any um, uh, NATO to go past that red line because if there was a nuclear capable missile on the border in Ukraine, on the border with Russia, it would only be about four or five minutes from hitting Moscow and they could not live with that and they could not defend against it. So they said, this is a red line that you cannot pass. This is um, essential for the security of Russia. The US would not agree to that red line and that's when the war, war started. So um, uh, that's, that's the background. And although in this country we heard that there were 100,000 or 150,000 Russians massing on the border and they were, they were going to attack, we didn't hear that there were 150,000 Ukrainians that were also massed on that border and that were and the bombing of Donbass and the shelling of Donbass was increasing at such a rapid rate that Russia tried to evacuate as many people as it could from those areas. And although we know a lot of people have been leaving Ukraine, we're not told about the fact that hundreds of thousands have left Ukraine for Russia, um, which is a whole different scenario. And we never hear any of their voices. So that's the situation that led to the war that we're seeing now um, in Ukraine, which is a terrible tragedy, what we're seeing in Ukraine. But there is a background to it and there is a history. And a number of us believe that the real um, uh, cause of the war is the NATO and US aggression towards Russia. So give us a little background on Zelensky. Well, uh, Zelensky, um, what I know from, you know, pretty much the media, as everybody else knows, he was an entertainer and he was a comedian. Um, and in fact, he had a show in um, Ukraine, uh, a comedy show, where they had him as the president of Ukraine on this comedy show before he was actually elected. And, you know, he was kind of making a mockery out of the different presidents and so forth. But when he ran, he ran against a, a real right winger that the U.S. supported. The U.S. was against Zelensky. Um, and, uh, but Zelensky was backed by some real money. He has some money, but some of the so-called oligarchs backed him. Um, and he said he was going to make better relations with Russia which I think the vast majority of people in Ukraine wanted. And the fact that he was Jewish, I think, made people think that maybe he was going to do something about the Nazi problem in their country. Because there, as I mentioned, there were Nazis um, uh, who give the fascist salute, um, you know, in the government, uh, in the military, and in the streets. And in the streets, they intimidated um, people and they murdered people. Uh, there's the fa very famous massacre um, that took place in Odessa, where people were protesting the coup in 2014 that took place. And a band of, a large band of fascists came from around the country and attacked them and killed around 50 and wounded a couple of hundred. And um, uh, that, that whole thing was never really investigated, but people didn't want to see that anymore. I went to, to Ukraine twice. The last time was in 2019. And I went to Odessa because each year they hold a memorial to the people that were killed by the fascists in the streets there. And uh, each year the fascists say they're going to come and, and do it again. So they wanted international observers to witness, to make sure to, for their own protection. So I was there. And I saw thousands and thousands and thousands of people from Odessa go to the memorial and lay flowers and, and so forth. And the families of the people that were killed were, came at a certain time and they got up on a platform and were going to give speeches. But the police uh, took away their sound equipment, wouldn't let them give speeches. But that night, there was a torchlight parade of the fascists through 
the streets of uh, Odessa and the police let them have their um, uh, uh, sound system. And um, uh, my wife, Pippa, took a video of that and uh, it is on the UNAC website. Um, UNAC is the group that I coordinate nationally, United National Anti-War Coalition. And the website is unacpeace.org and you could look for that video and you can uh, see this Torchlight Brigade. So anyway, also the, the woman that invited us and was hosting us had to leave uh, Odessa just as we got there. And the reason was there's these fascist websites. And when they put your name on it, you have to leave the country because you'll be killed if you're not. And this was never stopped. And so Zelensky never stopped it either. People help hoped that he would stop it and hoped he would make better relations with, with Russia, but he didn't. He increased the bombing of Donbass. He kept the fascists in the military and in the government, even though the fascists are not very popular. They got a very low vote. Uh, their party, Slavoda um, and the right sector, those parties got very low votes in the election where Zelensky was elected. And he didn't stop them in the streets. He didn't take down their websites and their threats. Um, and so it eventually led to the situation we see now. So when you put the news on, uh, Zelensky portrayed as the good guy and Putin is the bad guy. So give us your thoughts on Putin. Well, I consider myself a socialist and Putin is a capitalist. If I was in Russia, I would oppose Putin. Um, but I do believe um, uh, that the United States has been the aggressor towards Russia um, for a period of time now, as the whole country surrounded by military bases um, and, and missiles and does war games right on their border and is really in control of, of Ukraine. I mean, we just found a, a, a U.S. biological um, uh, lab there doing bio making biological weapons, which is illegal. And it's now been admitted to by uh, Victoria Newland um, to at a Senate hearing just recently, but that's illegal. It's illegal to make biological weapons. And, and what are the, these weapons? And they're very afraid that these labs are gonna come as actually more than one are gonna come into the hands of Russia and it will bring biological um, compounds to Russia you know, that are dangerous, but also it would point out what the United States has been doing. So I believe, although I don't like Putin, I'd like to see another kind of government in, in Russia. I believe the U.S. is the aggressor. The U.S. has, you know, a military in about 172 countries. It has about 20 times the number of foreign military bases as all other countries combined. Um, Russia has seven foreign military bases, and six of them are in the former Soviet um, uh, countries that are, are still supportive of Russia and, and allowed them to have bases there. And the other, the seventh is in, in Syria, where they were helping the Syrian government. So, you know, I never liked Saddam Hussein either, but I was against the U.S. war on Iraq. I never liked the Taliban either, but I was against the U.S. war on Afghanistan. It doesn't matter who the person is. If the United States attacks a country and denies them their right to self-determination and does their own future and tries to do regime change or puts harsh sanctions on them to hurt the people in those countries, what we need to do is we need to oppose those things. We need to oppose the aggression of the United States. We need to oppose oppose the uh, military attacks on other countries by the United States, and we need to oppose the sanctions. So although I'm not a fan of Putin, it's the United States that is wrong in this case, in my opinion. So from watching the news, I would say that your thoughts are in the minority. Um, it seems as though this thing, is worse, would you agree, than the Cuban Missile Crisis? What do you think? Well, I think it's very similar to the Cuban Missile Crisis, but it's in reverse. Now we have missiles on the Russian border and we think that's okay, but we didn't think it was okay for the Soviet Union to bring missiles into, um, into Russia. 
And I think it's a very serious situation. I mean, you know, the United States couldn't win in Afghanistan and, and finally left in total disarray, was kind of kicked out and the Taliban came back in. The United States definitively lost there as they definitively lost in Vietnam. But we didn't even wait a few months before we started pushing and prodding and, and pushing for another war. Um, and this time it's with a nuclear power. So there's, there's serious danger to the entire world here where, you know, it was a bad thing in Afghanistan, but the whole world was not in danger as it is now. And it's very, very serious. I mean, I hear today that there are some negotiations that are going on. Zelensky said he is um, in favor of perhaps not um, seeking membership in NATO. He said he's perhaps in favor of recognizing the independent areas in Donbass. And if that is true, there is a basis for peace now. And I think that's important. Yeah, the other thing to think about is the way that Russia went into Ukraine compared to the way that the United States goes into countries. When we went into Iraq, we went in with something called shock and awe, mm -hmm. and we massively bombed um, Baghdad. Um, during Vietnam, we carpet bombed uh, Hanoi. We destroyed just about every single building. There were civilians in those buildings, in those houses, you know, um, but that was all okay. And we didn't see in the news mothers crying and trying to get out of the country. When people did try to get out of the country in Iraq, we bombed the caravans of cars trying to get out of Iraq, saying, well, there could have been Saddam Hussein's people escaping Iraq right there, or it could have been Saddam Hussein was escaping. So we bombed those cars. Russia didn't do that. It didn't come in and bomb the cities first. It came in with troops and very slowly gave people chances to get out, ask them to get out, has tried to make humanitarian corridors. In this country, we hear that they didn't respect those humanitarian corridors. But if you listen to the Russian news, it's the other way around that they did. And it was the Ukrainians that were, wanted to use the propaganda piece that, um, that uh, civilians are being bombed, especially in Maripol, which is the Southern city where there's a lot of fighting going on right now, which is also the home of the Azov Brigade. And if you could get your um, Russian media, which is very difficult, but I'm getting it through Telegram, which is a secure service wow. and friends and people I know in Russia and in Ukraine. I've been talking to people in Odessa and I've been talking to people in Donbass. And it's a very, very different story than we hear on, on our media. It would be good if we could hear that side of the story, then people could make up their own minds, but we don't let that side of the story be heard in the United States. You know, you and I both watch the news and, and listen to the commentaries. The people that do the commentaries, I'm sure that they know that they're not truthful to the American people, right? Uh, do you think they have a conscience? Well, I think news media has changed drastically in the last several decades, and it's really just putting out the line of the um, uh, uh, of the State Department. There have been a number of um, uh, commentators. Uh, one was a guy named Lamont, a black guy in um, on CNN, who dared to tell a little piece of the truth. He didn't even tell it on CNN, but what he did was he testified. Um, uh, in the United Nations on things that he knew about um, between Israel and the Palestinians. And because they thought he was doing a favorable thing for the Palestinians, they fired him. So th these reporters know that they get fired. And you have to, if, if they don't toe the line, and they can just do whatever they want, but it's the editors that determine what actually gets heard and what gets seen. And you have to think back again to the Iraq war. We did something very different in Iraq than we did in past wars. We told all the reporters that they had to be embedded with the US military. So it was the US military which determined where they went, what they saw, and what they heard. 
there was no, from the United States, there were very few independent um, uh, um, reporters in Iraq and their voices didn't get onto the major news media at all. But from other countries, there were independent news um, media and many of them stayed in Iraq in something called the Palestine Hotel. That's where they were staying. And one of the first things the US did when it reached um, Baghdad uh, after we invaded Iraq was we shelled the Palestine Hotel where the reporters were. And we, a number were injured and three um, uh, um, Spanish reporters were actually killed. We were saying to the press of the world that you embed yourself with the US military and tell our side of the story or we will kill you. And that's, that was the message. And so reporting has in the United States drastically changed. And I believe it's very tightly controlled in the United States, even more than it had been in the past during other wars. Um, and you know, there's not a law that's passed that says you can't say this or you can't say that. This does happen in some countries under certain dictatorships, but it's controlled by money and it's controlled by who owns the airwaves and who can control things. And you might want to remember back to Clinton's administration, he changed the Telecommunications Act so that the very, very wealthy can control all the media and they have ever since. They've controlled the media and they determine what, what is said and what is not said. And so we hear their viewpoint and only their viewpoint. Joe, we're out of time for today, but I would love to have you back on the show to talk about this issue as it as it unfolds. Would you be willing to do that? Sure, anytime you'd like. Great. You've been listening to Joe Lombardo, and uh, if anybody wants to contact you and your organization, how could they do so? Well, our website is UNAC peace.org u-n-a-c-p-e-a-c-e dot o-r-g and on the left side of that home page there you could find a little link to get on our email list and we'll send you emails of events and activities that we're doing and you can get a different perspective than you're getting on the regular media thank you joe we shall talk again have a great day great thank you cynthia take care